without further ado, let's, uh, let's hang on a second. Somebody's recording me. Okay, um, here's the terrain, and I'm sure that most of you have been to Globe. Um, one of the interesting things about Globe, and probably an item that a lot of people don't know, is that it was originally a silver district. And the name Globe comes from a nine inch diameter uh, solid ball of silver that was called a globe of silver and then thus globe was was named uh, so this is uh, our project area and uh, you see the two red hills in the in sort of the middle middle ground back there and that's that's exactly where we found uh, the, the the big nugget as well as a number of small ones too so the first discovery and i've put this up this is a uh, uh, a, a, a lithograph from 1872, I think. So it's about 140, 150 years old. And you see uh, two very uh, uh, anxious looking people there. Um, uh, this is a prospector in, in Colorado. But uh, actually the discovery of the globe silver uh, was just the opposite. Um, the Apaches uh, originally had found detrital silver and they were smelting it uh, to use as bullets. So the original silver bullet uh, actually has an, its origin in, in globe, in, in truth. Uh, and so we have to reverse the, the picture there. The prospectors actually found the, um, the silver uh, by probably trading with the Apaches and finding that the Apaches had silver bullets. Um, so it was originally discovered by the Apaches um, and who were, you know, there was no reservation back then. So they roamed all through um, Arizona and New Mexico. The miners, the, the early uh, prospectors followed up with that, that silver discovery of the Apaches by finding load deposits in the Richmond Basin. And Richmond Basin, uh, so the, the prospectors went in there, they went in and mined the alluvial silver, uh, which was uh, in, uh, in Nugget Wash, aptly named. They followed those silver uh, nuggets back up to the low deposits, which were in the Richmond Basin, a little bit higher up on the hill. And probably a half a dozen high grade veins were then mined. Uh, this was in the uh, 1870s, early, uh, 18, uh, 19, uh, 1890s, up to the 1890s. And during that whole period, um, the camps were attacked by uh, the Apaches. Um, so it put a certain amount of pressure on anybody that was exploring out there. And then copper uh, started to dominate the region. So Globe was founded with the silver, but then the copper took over and the copper dominated um, all uh, the activity out there. So Globe itself was a safe place, um, but anything outside of Globe in the 1870s, 1880s was subject to Apache attack. So that coupled with the decline in the silver price. Um, so for a brief period, the United States was on a silver standard. Um, the, the, the chaos that ensued and the exit of gold from the United States um, caused the government to go back on the gold standard and the price of silver dropped. So the government at some point in the 1880s was uh, buying 3 million ounces of silver a year from producers, which artificially inflated the silver price. Once that was removed, um, silver declined and all these isolated silver deposits, no matter what the grade was, they, uh, they fell into... Uh, um, disuse. So the original discovery of this was not uh, through any scientific, uh, greater scientific uh, pursuits, but um, this is the original uh, founder. It, it's Sam Zamora. He uh, works at one of the mines up in Globe. And he was a weekend recreational metal detectorist. And he had two, two companions that, that went out with him. 
And instead of uh, watching football one Sunday, they decided to go out and do some metal detecting. Now, I will say that Sam detected for seven years in the greater globe area. Um, and in those seven years, he found three grams of gold in those seven years, yet he continued. And eventually this weekend, um, they found a 16 pound silver nugget. And this is the nugget, we call it the sweet potato. It looks like a, a number of other things too, but we call it the sweet potato. And that's, um, that's 16 pounds. And if you notice, it's pretty well rounded. This comes from actually another area, um, not, not our area. Um, and uh, it was another two years uh, before Sam and his partners found more silver. So they had this initial discovery. They didn't find any more in that area. And then uh, it took them another two years to really found, find uh, the, uh, the arroyo that these are coming out of. Um, so eventually Sam and his partners found uh, something in the order of about uh, 200 pounds of native silver in probably two dozen pieces. And the sizes that they found ranged from a few grams uh, to up to uh, 120 pounds. So the uh, sample on the left uh, with the hand on it, that's the 120 pounds. It doesn't take a lot of silver to make, uh, make, make up weight. And the one next to it is about 80 pounds. So these are the um, two of the three largest ones. And then the one on the, uh, on the right is probably about three or four pounds. And um, these, uh, the, the, the middle one, the 80 pounder and the two or three pounder, they have been treated with hydrofluoric acid uh, because generally the silver is encased in quartz. Um, so the, the one on the left has not been treated. Uh, so we made a deal with uh, Sam and his partners. Uh, they weren't interested in, in load mining. Um, they were, you know, they had, they had jobs. Um, they weren't so much interested in taking any further. So we made a deal with them. And once, uh, once the deal was done, um, and they do have a percentage interest in the, in the project. Once the deal was done, we went out and staked load and placer claims over the area. And uh, I brought in professional metal detectorists from Northern Mexico. And in Northern Mexico is a, a phenomenal district uh, with native gold deposits and native, native gold and, and, and placer workings. And so I brought in the... Uh, the professional detectors down there. And they proceeded to sweep the same area as uh, Sam and his partners had gone over. And um, we probably found another 100 pounds of silver in the same area. And they had higher power detectors. And, uh, and, and a lot of the silver was found at about a three foot or four foot depth. And with gold, of course, you need, um, you need a big piece to uh, get down to four feet. Um, usually these detectors only go down a few inches, but um, depending on the size of the metal, um, these, these will go down about four feet. So the soil profile isn't that, that deep out in that, this particular area. So um, in, in many cases, we went down to sort of the rubble interface just above bedrock. And, uh, and found these pieces. So another, say another 100 pounds was, was found during the first two weeks that uh, we swept this area with, um, with the metal detectors. So um, uh, this is uh, one, of my, one of my associates here and he's trying to get to the bottom of that hole. Um, it's very convenient to have a small child if, uh, if you have one, uh, to, they go right down to the bottom. Anyway, um, these are some of the samples that we found within the first couple of days, and they've got the weights uh, next to them in, in, uh, in metric, so they're in grams. So we've got uh, probably uh, two, three uh, kilograms in there down to a few grams. And then uh, we had a big hit. Um, this is the 417 pounder. 
And uh, this was just a few centimeters below the surface. So I would say not more than five or six centimeters. And so quickly, quickly dug it out. And uh, we're over probably uh, over three quarters of a mile from a road, the nearest road, the nearest forest road. And uh, so it was a long haul to get this out. It doesn't look very big. Um, and this particular piece is in the museum right now, downtown Tucson. Doesn't look big, but it is heavy. There was no way to get an ATV or a motorized vehicle in there. So what we did is uh, wrapped it up in corrugated metal sheet. And uh, there were five of us and we drug it out by hand, uh, which is actually no mean feat for the distance that we pulled it. And, and five people really wasn't wasn't adequate to haul this over the, over over Hill and Dale. And so the, the picture on the right here is we we had a little bit of a cliff to go over, not a big one, uh, in the Arroyo. And uh, and to get get the piece over this um, probably uh, four foot drop, and you know you could toss it over the edge, but these things are brittle, and uh, it's mixed with quartz. And so it was our understanding at that time and still that we've got the biggest piece of native silver in the world surviving. There were bigger pieces, but they've been broken up and smelted. So this is the, the largest piece of native silver in the world that we're aware of. We didn't want to make it the second largest piece. So uh, we hauled it, hauled it over this drop on a, on a uh, metal ladder. And uh, we eventually got it back to back to the road and and threw it on the back of the pickup truck here and that that piece just the metal content the silver content in it and it's not 100 percent silver it's uh, about 70 percent um and the rest is quartz uh but uh, uh still pretty dense and so here was the weigh-in uh we didn't have an idea of how much it weighed but uh got it got it back uh, to Tucson and uh, to, to really move it around, two, three people can't even move this. So we uh, went down and got an engine lifter and hoisted it up and put it on a scale. And so here we've got the 417. We sent it off to Denver, Colorado to Brian Lees and uh, he he cleaned it up. So uh, when when we had the the silver boulder originally, so it was covered with dirt. We we uh, we cleaned it off, and uh, but it still you know wasn't showing uh, much of the metal, and so uh, Brian Lees, who's a famous mineral dealer, uh, took it and soaked it in hydrofluoric acid, so it cleaned up some of the quartz. So um, it's it's now 411 pounds. So he he uh, dissolved about uh, five pounds, uh, six pounds of of quartz off it uh, in this tank. And uh, uh, he had a forklift to move this stuff around, but it, it looks a little bit better once it's been hydrofluoric. But you can see a little bit of the texture of the native silver in there. And here it is now as it sits in the museum. So uh, we've got the, the 417 pounder in the middle, the 80 pounder on the left and the 120 pounder on the right. And those were the three biggest pieces. And they were all found within a few meters of each other. So um, the two smaller ones were down a little bit lower uh, on this arroyo. And the big one was probably, I would say 15, 16 feet away uh, from that. All found probably broken off uh, the same vein, same ore chute. And, and uh, we walked up the arroyo a little bit more and there's a vein there. Uh, now the vein doesn't have any native silver in it, um, but it's anomalous in silver. It's mainly quartz and uh, and and uh, siderite uh, breccia. And the vein is probably about a meter wide, and that's that's really our focus uh, as an exploration company. The the native silver on the surface is like a tremendous soil anomaly, probably the the largest silver anomaly in the world. Uh, but we treated it just as a soil anomaly. We're really after um, the mother load. Where, where did these things come from? 
And uh, really, it's uh, let me go back to there there for a minute. It's our belief that these haven't traveled very far. Uh, we've plotted up all the locations of the detrital silver that we found in the Arroyo, and they get smaller. Uh, so we had the the 417 very close to the vein outcrop itself, and then we had the 80 pounder and the 120 pounder uh, just down the arroyo from that. And as we go down arroyo, uh, they're probably about 300 meters uh, from from the original vein. Um, the fragments get smaller and smaller, so um, they're breaking up as they as flood events um, float these. Uh, these cobbles downstream. And, uh, you know, at the end of it, we're looking at, say, 30 gram pieces. And, and originally, we thought, you know, we probably got a large silver resource just in the gravels down below. And it's actually uh, hasn't been found to be the case because silver, unlike gold, dissolves. And the only way you're going to find silver boulders like this is to beat Mother Nature to it because they will, they eventually dissolve. Um, uh, in, in, in the larger piece here, you see a black uh, coating, um, that's chlorargyrite. And so the silver starts to oxidize. It's, uh, we'll, I'll go into the mineralogy in a second here, but the surface of it is, is covered with um, silver tarnish. So the silver starts to oxidize and then the, uh, chlorogerite is water soluble, so it washes away. Um, is the is this these silver boulders? Is it unique? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, they're rare, and they they are uh, a rare uh, phenomena, but they're not so unique. So the largest nugget uh, was found at the Smuggler Mine in Colorado, and I believe the the one on the left is the the Smuggler Mine nugget. And that was uh, over over a ton, and it's it's been broken up, and there there might be some existing pieces in a museum, but there's no remnant uh, as large as 400 pounds right now. Um, the other piece was uh, uh, from uh, a mine in British Columbia. It did have native silver in it, but it was mixed with galena, and that's what I think we're seeing that big piece. Um, other deposits that have native silver. Probably the most famous one is uh, is Cobalt, Ontario, which was discovered in the, at the turn of the last century, the 1900s. And um, they've come to call these uh, five element veins uh, because not only do they have silver, but they have uh, nickel, cobalt, arsenic, um, and uh, and that's that's what we have in cobalt. Now, cobalt was is it's it's been mined out it's uh, but it was a big district it was about a, a 400 million ounce silver district as well as whatever um other metals were pulled out of it now it now there's a lot of interest because there is cobalt there cobaltite and so for the battery industry of course they're they're back in the cobalt district looking for cobalt as opposed to silver but it has a very similar dendritic pattern as ours does up in, in Globe. And by the way, um, the host rock for cobalt in Ontario is a Proterozoic diabase intruding um, uh, Archean or Proterozoic uh, metasedimentary units. And that's exactly what we've got in Globe. So we've got a 1.1 billion year old uh, diabase silt uh, it's intruding the Apache group, the Proterozoic um, metasedimentary rocks of, of Arizona. And uh, so there is that, that similarity there. Um, so the globe silver uh, is represented at, at the Smithsonian Museum. They have a 30 pounder uh, in the, the mineral museum uh, in Washington, D.C. And that, this is it. Um, and if they say silver after chlorargyrite, it should be chlorargyrite after silver. Um, but this was one of the original uh, silver boulders that was found probably in the 1890s or so, and then, and then donated to the museum. But I can tell you that the, the 
University of Arizona Museum has the has the has the king. They have the big one. Uh, other deposits of native silver. Well, the Keweenaw Peninsula in, in Michigan. Uh, a lot of times, the native copper uh, in in northern Michigan is also associated with the silver. And so I think it composes about five percent of the deposit. Um, so and and there are pieces of native silver um, that can be found detritally uh, in northern Michigan, and also as crystals that are etched out of uh, out of the wall rock there. Another native silver deposit um, that that occurs in the southwest is over in Silver City, New Mexico. And that's the Alhambra mine. And the, the two samples uh, on the right are slabs from the Alhambra mine. Very similar setting. Um, it doesn't have the diabase, but it is in Proterozoic uh, granite. And uh, it was mined back in the 1940s. It also had uranium in it. Um, our textures are a little bit different. They're a little coarser and they're infilled with quartz. So this is sort of what it looks like. And this is uh, the, the lower left is the assay button uh, from some of the silver that we had assayed. I think it came back about 50% um, when, we, when we sampled this. And uh, we, we haven't taken a lot of samples. What I do is do a specific gravity test on this because it's a native metal, generally um, silver and quartz. Uh, there are some silver uh, sulfides in there, but generally it's silver and quartz. And so we, we just put it into uh, a uh, specific gravity formula and we determine the percentage silver in the rock. But, you know, keep in mind that, that, the, that the richest silver deposits right now are probably a thousand to fifteen hundred grams per ton. Um, if we converted the percents to grams per ton, we'd be looking at between five hundred thousand grams to seven hundred thousand grams of silver per ton. So one ton of 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 ore, if we can if we can uh, find the uh, source of this, would be worth about a quarter of a million dollars. These are some of the nuggets that, that have come out. Now, some of them are, are, are big and covered with uh, the silver tarnished tarnish chlorargyrite. Some of them are, that have been tumbled in the smaller nuggets usually come out with this kind of uh, brain-like texture on the, on the left. And subsequent to our discovery, there have been other metal detectorists, local guys that have gone out there, not on our property, but on, on neighboring properties that are under claim. Um, and they've detected four native silver, and they have found the native silver without the quartz and its uh, beautiful herringbone uh, crystals uh, within smaller uh, specimens. We did do a little petrology here, and we found that um, the native silver is actually mixed with mercury. Uh, so we've got about 2% mercury in the native silver itself. Uh, we have just a little bit of uh, uh, silver sulfide uh, mineralization there, and that, that's in the form of uh, acanthite. We also have um, very unusual silver minerals, uh, halapite uh, and mckinstriite, which are silver copper sulfides. And one really unusual thing that we found is tin uh, in this. So it, uh, we've had up to... Uh, 6% uh, tin in the silver as well. We haven't detected uh, any unique tin minerals in it. We think it's like the silver. It's some sort of an amalgam um, that the silver is mixed with. Uh, but we have a, a, a potassic rich uh, intrusion nearby. And we believe that the tin could be derived uh, from that uh, potassic intrusion. Um, you know, while we're waiting for our permits to drill out there, and we, we, we have a number of uh, drill holes that we're trying to permit right now to get to, get to the big silver. Uh, we've, we've detected um, about 12,000 ounces of the silver rock. And not only in this particular area, 
uh, in this particular arroyo, we sent the detectorists out over cross country on our claims. And we found another swarm of uh, silver nuggets. And we believe those are actually overlying another silver vein. And so uh, that's, that's part of our exploration in the district. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for those permits, we, uh, you know, we had cut some of the samples and they looked very attractive. And so we had some local uh, uh, lapidary guys cut this into, into jewelry. And that, that's what it looks like. So it's a really good example of what the, what the textures are, are like there. And some of the local um, artists in town here uh, actually made, made some of our silver into jewelry. So the one on the left is actually just a piece of raw silver uh, that, that um, Kevin Smith, uh, one, of, one of the a local artists, had just uh, ground and polished. And, it, and it's interesting because it comes out with a very unique texture here. Um, you can see on the, on the right side of that um, first photo that there's more massive silver and then we've got a quartz vein, and you can actually see the quartz crystals, the quartz crystal outline in that vein, and uh, and then kind of disseminated native silver off to the side there. And and to tell you the truth, these veins are probably not going to be very thick. They might be six inches to a foot wide. The big slab of silver, the the four seventeen, is about six inches thick, and it and it doesn't seem you know like a very big target. But when you consider it 70% silver, you, you don't really need a very thick um, silver vein uh, like that to make uh, a lot of a lot of ounces. And so the other the other two uh, pieces were done by other artists down in Bisbee. Did a really phenomenal job. Uh, beautiful textures in there. You can see some of the herringbone uh, uh, crystalline silver that's been infilled with quartz afterwards. And there's some more makes great jewelry and uh, haven't sold any of it, but uh, you know, we've got 12,000 ounces and rather send it to a smelter. Um, we'll probably just uh, deal it off as uh, for material for people to make jewelry out of. Our target is really a uh, hundred million ounces. So the, the ounces that we found are interesting, they're beautiful, but uh, really our target is uh, still in the ground. So our next step in this whole business is to permit We've staked 100 claims out there, and and we'd like to like to drill this. We've got a really good targets. Um, uh, we've had some geophysics and some geochemistry. And by the way, when we wash the dirt off of the nuggets, uh, we uh, we assayed some of the some of the just the dirt that sticks to it, and the assays came back two percent silver in just the soil that's around it. So you can see that these nuggets are actually dissolving and seeping into the soil around it. Anyway, we've outlined a few anomalies out there. We're going to, we're going to drill test it as well as the, the outcrop that these things have probably come off of. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the geology. I, I think this is an unfolding story, so I don't want to go too much into things that probably will change when we drill. But this is, uh, this is a map from the 1950s. The brown, is the diabase. The red is the, uh, the alkali intrusion, the high potassium intrusion where we think the tin might have been derived from in the silver. <clears throat> the origin of the silver itself, we don't know. There, uh, at the base of the Apache group, um, there is a conglomerate that's impregnated with uh, hematite, specular hematite. Um, the matrix of, of the conglomerate, it's a basal conglomerate for the metasedimentary unit. It's sitting on top of the Proterozoic granite. And in many places, it's completely permeated with specular hematite. It's black, the matrix is black. And we're just wondering, you know, what could be the source of the silver here? And, and by the way, the, the silver, uh, 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 the alluvial silver comes out of that uh, the green uh, green dot there, so it's it's in the diabase, but it's not too far away from the potassic uh, uh, potassic intrusion. Um, so what the the source of the original source of the silver was unknown. Uh, could it could it be sort of a uh, derived from 
the sedimentary units quite possible. Um, it had to be in an environment where they're very low, very low sulfur content. For this to precipitate as native silver, in my opinion, it's almost like an electrolytic um, uh, formation. And there have been recent papers written on, on these five element metal veins. And one theory is that methane was the causative, um, uh, the causative uh, feature in these deposits. That's what precipitated a lot of this sort of hydrofracking by methane gas and sort of a rapid um, degassing of the methane precipitated some of the silver. I don't know, but it's a very, seems to me like a very electrolytic um, process. You know, you get uh, crystals of copper in tank houses. Well, we've got maybe a similar process here in nature. Um, I'll just give you, a, I think this is the final shot, but um, sort of a regional overview of it. And this is very speculative, but um, we have um, sort of an alineation of, of copper deposits. Um, my personal opinion is that the silver is Proterozoic in age, it's probably the same age as the host rocks, like like Cobalt, Ontario, also Proterozoic, like uh, Alhambra over in, in New Mexico, also in Proterozoic rocks, without any causative intrusion around it. But uh, saying that, um, there is uh, a lineation of copper, major copper deposits in the area. So we have the magma mine, the associated uh, source of that, the resolution deposit. Carlotta, Pinto Valley, Inspiration, Copper Cities. Um, and, and they do form a, a sort of a elongated zone. And if we put um, our property there, which is, uh, it's basically titled the Mexican mine, which is another native silver deposit up there. And our, our claim block is in red. It tends to line up very well with the copper deposits. And on our property, uh, we have found veinlets in the diabase that have epidote and chalcopyrite, and that's the shot on the right. Uh, we've got we've got a sort of a classic propolitic type vein with chalcopyrite in it that is not far from the silver vein and where we found the silver. But again, the vein that we believe is the source vein for the silver is not propolitically altered. It has no alteration in the rock around it. So could we be looking at two events overlapping um, spatially, but not temporally? I don't know. And, and hopefully that's one of the things we'll, we'll try to resolve uh, as we go forward with the, with the drilling of this. And, you know, I hope, uh, I hope I can come back in a few months and say we've really uh, hit, the, hit the silver, to, the, the source of the silver uh, down below here but uh, just no telling what we're gonna find. So it's an unfolding story. And I think that's, that's about it. Um, if, if you've got any questions that I can entertain, I'd be happy to. Hello, everybody. If, if you wanna unmute yourself and, and ask Chris a, a question, please go ahead. Hi, Chris, this is Dan Aiken. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Uh, I was wondering, and maybe you covered this and I missed it, but have you uh, uh, done geochems on uh, a broad expanse of the diabase to find out if there's, if the diabase might be acted as a heat pump? Uh, I know there's uranium associated with diabase up in the Sarah Anches. Uh, is there anomalous silver in any of the diabase? And uh, could that be, ex that, that interpretation be extended to other diabase locations in central Arizona. Uh, that's a that's a good question, and we've we've done geochemistry um, through uh, XRF, and only in the immediate area of the vein. Um, so I can't can't really speak on the on the diabase as a whole. But what I will say is this: <clears throat> that uh, over at the Alhambra mine uh, in New Mexico, it was really examined by the USGS as a source of uranium. And there is uraninite uh, in the silver veins over there. Um, uh, the uranium that here uh, on, on our property, really, I haven't noticed anything anomalous. Um, but I, I will also say that there are other type of silver veins out here. 
So there's silver veins mixed with manganese oxides uh, and barite um, to the south uh, of, of this native silver vein. Um, so uh, I think it's still early days and I think maybe the, the diabase being the source uh, or the heat pump is certainly makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Um, this is David Briggs. I've got some questions. Uh, the, um, do you find arsenic or nickel or cobalt associated with any of this? Or no, no. The, the arsenic is elevated, um, but not, uh, there's no arsenic minerals. It seems to be elevated. We've got maybe a thousand PPM arsenic in this. Um, uh, we've actually done some sampling of water uh, in the area. The, wa the water seems to be elevated in arsenic. Um, you know, the, the nearest well to this is probably mm, about, a, about a kilometer away and I wouldn't drink the water out of the well, I can tell you that. Um, and uh, Allison actually did a study for us out there on the water. Um, but uh, uh, the only elevated geochem we have in this is, is tin. Mercury, very, very high in mercury. So we had 20, it would be 20,000 ppm mercury in, in a lot of the samples of the native silver. Um, this is not something you want to cook off in your kitchen. Like uh, the original metal detectorists, they, they found this and I think they cooked it off in their house, but uh, that means that there's 2% mercury in their, their living room kitchen uh, area. So uh, it, what we also found anomalous is uh, tungsten. We had up to um, several thousand ppm tungsten in some of the silver, and that's about it. It doesn't, it lacks the cobalt, it lacks the nickel that uh, Cobalt Ontario has. Have, have you been able to develop a, a model, it's probably way too soon, where uh, some of the suspected veins align with extensional structures that might have fed the diabase? And uh, if that's the case, uh, what is it about the, the Proterozoic uniquely that, that uh, might have high silver? Was that a, a particular unique moment in time? Uh, good question. Uh, you know, certainly, um... In, in Arizona, New Mexico, and Cobalt, Ontario, there seems to be that association with the Proterozoic. Whether the silver came out of um, the metasedimentary rocks, I, I don't know. But I will say that um, I think it's the Scanlon conglomerate uh, with all that specular hematite in its black. Um, right. Could, could, have, could that have been the transport mechanism? Could there have been a, a paleo aquifer along that conglomerate that in some way focus these silver rich minerals uh, in there. You know, the, the conglomerate also seems to be a little bit anomalous in silver. Um, not as high as, uh, not as high as the native silver. There's no native silver in the conglomerate, but um, up at the Richmond, the Richmond Basin mines, they actually did mine uh, the, that conglomerate as a manto because there was a little bit of silver in it where the silver vein crossed um, the conglomerate, uh, it blossomed out into a manto. And that, that was mined. And that's in a, in a thesis dating from the 1930s at the U of A. Could there be some relation? Could it could have been a source, the conglomerate? Could have been a, a transport source? I don't know. But good to speculate on. Chris, what do you hope to get your drilling program going? Well, uh, we've been in uh, permitting for a year. And uh, it, is on, um, it is on the Tonto National Forest. And I will say okay. that the Forest Service has been pretty amenable, uh, no, no problems there. The problem they have is that there's no geologist for the forest. Um, and uh, there was a national directive this summer that all able-bodied personnel have to go on fire duty. And so mm -hmm. they basically drafted the geologist yeah that was responsible for this area. And he spent four months or five months up in Montana, wow. uh, you know, fighting fire. And so that puts an automatic five month hold on all permitting processes. And they don't, they don't, they don't have geologists to put in into the, the forest. So mm -hmm. if anybody's out there and they want a job, um, 
and I've talked to the district ranger. They are they are looking for geologists to help out with uh, with the permitting. Um, and and another item that uh, Adam Bromley, the district ranger, mentioned is that th this the the Tonto National Forest is the busiest forest in the country nationally um, with respect to um, mineral projects. And he said that they had 28 different applications out um, just for the Tonto National Forest, which, which is the highest in the country. And they just can't get um, professional experienced geologists to work on the forest. Yeah. That's fascinating. I had no idea that the Tonto was seen as a real, uh, as a large mineral resource. Number one in the country, according to the ranger. Wow, great. Yeah, right. Do you have any more questions? Uh, yes. Uh, how, how does the deposits in around the Mexican Mine Canyon and Richmond Basin compare to, say, the Stonewall Jackson Mine or Rambo's vein or Rescue Vein, both of which were pretty high silver content? How do they relate to one another? Excuse me? Uh, well, I think they, they are all related. Um, and uh, so I think there's, there's these silver veins that outcropped that they found, and there's probably a large amount that they haven't found. And that's what we're looking at. Um, and you know, in the Cobalt District, there were, there were dozens, literally dozens of small veins. Now they're not big veins but they're extraordinarily high grade. And uh, in, in, in looking at deposits and how you, how you look at these things, the grade is really the king. And as I said, if, if you know, we had an ore shoot, and these are probably an ore shoots, no doubt about it. But if we had one that was say 50 feet long, uh, 200 feet deep, uh, six inches wide, we'd be looking at um, and, and uh, 60 to 70% 70, 70 silver. These are richer than the cobalt veins. Um, if we had those type of grades over that small interval, that would be 50 million ounces right there. So we're not only looking for where this silver came from, we're gonna be looking for other veins that are under alluvial cover. They're not gonna be big, very short strike length, but they're gonna be incredibly rich. Uh, does it have uh, what type of lead content is the stuff that Mexican mine have? Uh, lead content? Yeah. Uh, actually, very low lead. Uh, our, our silver has very low lead in it. Very low lead. So yeah, it's, it's hardly anomalous. Rambo's camp were assaying 50 or 60 percent lead. That's right, and I will I will tell you, Rambo's is to the south of us. Yeah. And. Uh, I think what what we're seeing uh, is several different types of silver veins. So there are silver veins with manganese associated with it, um, with vanadium, um, and, uh, and and actually molly. And so you've got vanadates uh, to the south of us, as well as um, um, yeah, wolfenite crystals. They're famous collector localities out there. And I think that's, they're probably different type of silver vein that might be associated with porphyry coppers to the south of us also. That's my opinion that they are probably related to porphyry systems as opposed to stuff that say the Mexican mine or uh, Richmond Basin or perhaps Stonewall Jackson mine. I don't know too much about the geology of that one. I, 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 I would agree with you. I think there's different type of silver deposits out there. Okay, and it's just, uh, a, a coincidence uh, information that the porphyries came in and overprinted the older silver. It's quite possible. Quite possible. Yeah. It, it might have been a silver rich environment, uh, and maybe the silver was remobilized out of out of the older rocks and and into these veins around the porphyries. Yeah, I know the, the silver district. Well, it attracted initially attracted the attention of prospectors early on. It just, I mean, they kind of ran out of gas pretty quick, and they switched to the copper uh, as 
as, a, as an alternative, I guess. Well, you know, when you pick up all the silver on the ground and there's no more silver to pick up, you'll lose interest in it. And oh, yeah. with, with the advent of these metal detectors, the metal detector, I have to tell you, is probably the best geophysical tool we could use out there. Um, and we found another area, um, not too far, probably three kilometers away from this, another area completely, um, uh, com completely undiscovered previously. We probably harvested about 100 uh, nuggets off the top of it. It's actually a cloud. It's, it's a cloud of silver. And that cloud has a strike to it. And we don't, we don't see any bedrock. And I assumed, well, these are alluvial outflows from the Richmond Basin. But in actual fact, the silver is restricted to a strike line, uh, probably 300 feet long uh, and, and, and 50 feet on either side. And there's just silver nuggets on both sides of it. So what's underneath that? We don't know, but it seems to be localized right there. What's the trend that you have, Chris, on that cloud? Uh, the, 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 the trend of the cloud is the same trend as the silver vein we've got to the south, and that's about north uh, 10 east. Hey, Chris, you have a question in the chat from Gary asking about the origin of the term ruins granite and what is the chemical makeup? Uh, there's probably other people that could answer that better than I <laughs> um, right, right here. Um, so yeah. uh, please chip in. Uh, I don't know what the origin of the ruined granite is, the name of it. Um, but it's, it's also called the Oracle granite. It's a Proterozoic granite that right. uh, underlies most of Arizona and Northern Mexico. Wow. Well, Chris, this has been great. I, maybe we've taken up enough of your time. I, I should point out that David, Dave Briggs is, is too humble to say it, but he's working on a, uh, a, a mining history and a geologic history of the globe area that's I think the is, is gone now over 200 pages in length, and he hopes to be publishing that soon. Uh, well, just uh, David, hang on until we make another discovery here. <laughs> Wouldn't want to exclude the best part of the Globe District. I was say, it seems like you need to add a chapter in there for your work, Chris. <laughs> yeah, just keep the keep the last part, the last chapter open for the finale here. I'll I'll uh, I'll do that. Okay, when, anytime you want to take a look at this, David, uh, be happy to show you the pieces and, uh, and let's go down to the museum and I'll show you the, the big pieces down there. I think you should at least have a photograph of the big pieces for the cover of the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we should probably wrap it up. I don't know what time it is, I've lost track. 728. Uh, any final questions before we let Chris go? Well, thank you all for yes. us. Thanks, Chris, and thank you all for joining us. And Chris, that was a great talk, so. No, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Okay, cheers. Excellent talk. Cheers. Thank you. Dave, I'm glad to see you feeling better. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'm, I'm still hanging in there. That's good. Corey gave me updates, so I was glad to hear you were doing better. Yeah. Yep. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.